the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man. And I'm here to read the funnies to you happy boys and honeys. Yes, boys and girls, it's Comic Weekly time. And here I come right into your house to bring a little fun and happiness. Right out of the pages of Puck the Comic Weekly, straight into your living room, your friend, the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man. Hello, hello, hello. Hello, hello, hello. Well, <laughs> little Miss Honey, how are you today? Oh, I'm just fine, 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 fine. Well, what makes you feel so fine, 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 fine? Oh, because next week I'm going to have the biggest dinner of the year next to Christmas. And what dinner is that? Well, I'll give you a hint. Thanks for coming. 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 Now, what day has to do with coming? Oh, no, no. Uh, but all right, I'll give you another hint. All right, give me another hint. Uh, thanks for giving me the funnies. Funnies? Now, what's a holiday that has to do with funnies? Oh, you're way off. I'll try it again, will you? Thanks for giving me the funnies. Thanks for give. Oh, Thanksgiving. <laughs> of course. Why, of course. And what are you going to have for Thanksgiving? Ooh, turkey and cranberry and pumpkin pie, and you're invited for dinner. Well, thank you very much. I'll come, because if there's anything I like on Thanksgiving, it's turkey and cranberries and pumpkin pie. Well, that's just wonderful. Now, will you please read me the funny? Puck the Comic Weekly? Mm -hmm. Very well, I'll read that in just a moment. But before I do, let's listen to this nice man. Now, here we go with Puck the Comic Weekly. And on top of the first page, hop along, Cassidy. Magic words for the music, please. Very well, my lady. Six guns blazing as he thunders along. Give us music for Hop Along. <laughs> to a pouring rain, Hoppy, California, and Lucky, with the marshal and the reinforcements that Hoppy had brought, are continuing on their way through the Indian country after having found the cavalry massacred at the stagecoach stop. They've been moving cautiously through the woods. The marshal says, Those murdering redskins must be somewhere in this area. Hoppy, who looks through the clearing, sees a wagon proceeding down the trail. He says, Which means that hay wagon driver may be headed for trouble unless we warn him. So Hoppy, California, and a few others gallop toward the wagon to warn the men driving. Seeing them approaching, a man on the wagon, first picture, second row, pulls up a gun and fires at him. <coughs> California shouts, Hey, Duck! Blame fools! They think we're road agents! Spurring ahead, Hoppy rapidly narrows the gap between them. The men in the wagon whip up their horses and gallop on faster. Hoppy draws up alongside, third picture, middle row, leaps out of the wagon, and last picture, second row, one of the men swings his rifle and hits Hoppy in the face with a butt. Hoppy falls off. California and his pals rein up beside him. The wagon continues on its way. Second picture, bottom row, one of the men in the wagon exclaims, Well, that ought to delay him till we make a getaway. Meeker's game would be ruined if that bunch got their hands on the rifles hidden inside these hay bales. But last picture, unnoticed, the telltale clue is jarred loose from the swaying load as a bale of hay falls off the rear of the wagon to the ground. Oh, that was terrible, the way that man hit Hoppy in the face with the gun. Yes, he could have broken his jaw. Do you think he did? I'm not sure. I wonder if California or Lucky or somebody will see that bale of hay that dropped off and then maybe they'll see the rifles behind it. Well, let's hope so. Why should they hide those rifles? I have a suspicion that those men are selling the rifles to the Indians. Oh, and then the Indians use them against the white men? That's right. So that's why the Indians have been on the war path then, because they have good weapons. That's exactly it. And we'll find out more about this next week. Now? Oh, look, there on page three, there's Prince Valiant. And I'm anxious to read that because Prince Valiant's father, King Egwa, has signed something that you call a... Um, uh, um, a treaty. It's an agreement not to plunder any more ships. Yes. And last week, you remember Voltar, who was Val's friend, was coming home from a long journey. And all of a sudden, he saw a ship. And on that ship was that girl, Adele, who'd fallen in love with Ark. That's right. And Voltar captured that ship. And I want to see what Val will say about that. And I want to see if Adele and Ark will meet each other again. Well, let's read right now and find out. So here we go with Prince Valiant and the days of King Arthur. Eckert, Breckert, Gray Malkin, and Quince. Music romantic for a fair, fair prince. <laughs> Voltar and his rough Vikings have captured the ship of Sir Deluc. In the scuffle, little Adele, Deluc's daughter, falls to the deck in a faint. 
Sir DeLuke stands over his daughter's body and yells at Boltar, the Sea King. Traitor, we sail with your king's guarantee of safety. His banner of the Crimson Stallion flies at our masthead. Traitor! Boltar looks surprised and stops for a moment. Whereupon Sir DeLuke hands him a paper bearing the agreement. First picture next row, Boltar sits down, looks at the paper, and frowns. He fingers the guarantee impatiently. He cannot read, but he knows the royal seal. A free and independent pirate doesn't want to be bothered by diplomatic details. This paper is too difficult for him to figure out, so he decides to let Val and King Aguar settle it for him. He orders his men to board his ship again. And last picture, second row, he allows the vessel of Sir Deluc to limp into Trondjemsbjorn and follows close behind. For if there is any doubt, he wants the plunder. First picture, bottom row, news of Boltar's deed is brought to King Aguar. The king is angry because his banner has been ignored. Gaharis sees all hope of peaceful trade between Thule and Orkney vanish with this crime. But young Arf, enraged that Adele, the girl he loves, is hurt, cries bitterly for punishment. Last picture, soldiers of the king are sent to Boltar's ship, and he is arrested. All the Vikings and sea kings of Thule cry out against this threat to their freedom to plunder where and whom they please. Oh, they don't like it that they can't plunder anymore, do they? No, because that's something they've always been permitted to do. Well, but I think that's wrong that anybody who wants to can capture some ship and just take whatever's on it. And it is wrong. Do you think King Agua will make the Vikings behave themselves? Well, that's something we'll find out more about next week. And now I think it's time for Flash Gordon. All right, let's turn over the page and see if he's there. Nope, he's Jungle Jim, but no Flash Gordon. Well, let's turn over another page. All please. right, over another page we go. And here he is, Flash Gordon. Oh, and this time it's really exciting because you remember Flash had been captured by the Martians and the Queen had had her men try to put a helmet on his head that would make him a slave. Yes, but Flash succeeded in overpowering the guard who tried it. And then he and Dale and Link, their friend, captured the Queen. And then they took the Queen with them and they got into a car and they were trying to escape with the Queen as their prisoner, and I wonder if they will succeed. Well, let's read right now and find out. Here we go with Flash Gordon. Riga Riga Doon Doon, Saskimatash. Let's have music for Heroic Flash. <laughs> Escaping from his Martian captors, Flash commandeers a sand car and takes Queen Menta along as a hostage. The sand car speeds toward the rocket port where Flash's ship is grounded, racing ahead of a sudden desert sand blizzard. But not even the incredible speed of the sand car is enough to beat the blizzard. A screaming hurricane of ice and sand swallows them up last picture top row. Flash can scarcely make himself heard as he shouts, If we don't find shelter soon, we're doomed! First picture, bottom row, great masses of swirling sand hurtle from the dune tops and toss the car around as if it were an autumn leaf. Flash fights the controls, but nothing he does can stop the car from overturning. Almost miraculously, the occupants of the car escape injury. Queen Menta's fear soon gives way to rage. She's furious. She tells Flash the storm is burying them to check the instruments and find their location so she can send a thought message ordering her men to rescue them. But Flash prefers the blizzard's fury to recapture. And then, as suddenly as it arose, the storm is over. Last picture, Flash and his party are faced with a new danger. The icy sand has frozen in in the bleak Martian night. And they are entombed under a giant dune as hard as concrete. Oh, well, if they're buried like that, it's almost like being buried alive. They won't be able to breathe. They'll die. Yes, that's a terrible situation to be in. Not only that, but if they don't find a way out, they'll have no food. I wonder what Flash will do now. He'll just have to let Menta send a thought wave to her people. Yes, it certainly looks that way. But if that happens, they'll be recaptured. That's a terrible decision. Yes, it certainly is. But we'll find out about that next week. Now it's time for Dagwood and Blondie. Oh, and here they are on the first page of the second section. And we won't waste another second. Here we go with Dagwood and Blondie. Ramafoo, ramafum, zim, zim, zombie. Conjure me music for Dagwood and Blondie. Dagwood's boss, Mr. Dithers, is sitting at home very unhappy. His wife asks him if his conscience is bothering him. He answers, Yes, 
I feel terrible about the way I've treated Dagwood all these years. She tells him it's not too late to make things up to Dagwood. He answers, Yes, you're right. I could give him a nice raise to show him how much I appreciate all his years of loyal service to me. His wife smiles and says she's sure Dagwood will be very grateful. So last picture top row, Dither stands up and says emphatically, I'll pay him a social call and announce his raise in front of his whole family. <laughs> The Bumstead home, first picture next row. Everybody is heading for the door with their coats on, ready to go out. Dagwood says cheerfully, Well, come on, everybody. We don't want to be late for the show. Just then the doorbell rings. It's Mr. Dithers who stands outside, saying to himself, A person gets so much joy out of doing a kind deed like this. Blondie peeks through the window and tells Dagwood, last picture, second row, it's Mr. Dithers. Dagwood exclaims, Oh, he probably wants me to work tonight. Quick, everybody, out the back door before he sees us. They all head for the back door. Out they tiptoe, close the door, and tiptoe for the sidewalk. First picture next row, Dither sees them and yells, hey, Come back here, Bumstead! Whereupon they all dash away. <laughs> Around the house they go. Around the garage. Dagwood shinnies up the porch. Scrambles up the roof. Slides down the other side. Last picture, third row, jumps for the ground. Dither lands on him in midair. First picture, bottom row, they hit the ground. And the fight begins. Dagwood <laughs> yells, Help! He's murdering me! Alexander shouts, We'll save you, Pop! But Mr. Dither wait on Dagwood and tells the family, hey, Wait! Wait, wait. I just wanted to tell you that starting today, I'm giving you a $10 a week raise. And then Mr. Dithers walks off. Dagwood, with his clothes torn to pieces and his face covered with bruises, sits up and says, last picture, Isn't he a swell, boss? And Mr. Dithers, his clothes torn to pieces and his face covered with bruises, goes down the walk saying, It's a wonderful feeling to have your employees love you like that. Yes, what a way to tell a man he's going to get a raise. <laughs> yes, but if it really happened, why, the doctor bills would be so expensive that it just wouldn't do any good to get a raise. No. The money would be spent anyway. <laughs> That's right. And now look underneath Dagwood and Blondie. Here's Roy Rogers. Oh, I'm anxious to read that. So am I, and I'll read that in just a moment. But first, here's that nice man again with something interesting to say. <laughs> Now, here we go again with Puck the Comic Weekly. At the bottom of the first page of the second section, Roy Rogers, King of the Cowboys. Magic words for the music, please. Very well, my lady. A yip -a Now, here we go with Roy and Trigger. A yip -a <laughs> Roy and Jack Spratt, deputy sheriff, investigating at Lot Craner's ranch, have fallen into a mine shaft. They were joined there a moment later by Blot Kramer, who had been accused by Norton and the cattleman's consul of being a cattle rustler. Kramer tells Roy and Jack that he has come back to clear himself with the law. While they're in the shaft, Norton, who is responsible for all the trouble, and his henchman, Carp Manoray, knowing that the three men are in the shaft, set a dynamite explosion hoping to get rid of Roy. As the sound of the explosion dies away, Mallory says... Well, the dynamite blast plugged that mine shaft good. Rogers and the other two are buried. Norton replies, Right, Carp. You stay in the line shack and keep an eye on things. I'll head for town, file the claim, and report the uh, accident. Meanwhile, in the shaft, the men are still alive, but hemmed in on all sides by the earth which has collapsed. Jack Spratt exclaims, Hey, we're trapped! Roy lights a lantern and answers, now, Maybe not. Hey, Kramer. Is there any other way out of here? Kramer answers. Well, there's a slim chance. Long ago, I dug a drip from my line shack to this shaft, but a cave-in blocked it off. Last picture, top row. Kramer points to it, saying, Yeah, there it is. But we got to get through before the air gives out, or we're done. Roy picks up a pickaxe and starts digging. <laughs> First picture, bottom row. A little later, Roy takes one more poke at the earth, and the shovel goes through. He exclaims, Ah, we're through. I can smell fresh air. A little more effort, and they made a hole big enough to crawl through. They find themselves in a basement underneath Kramer's shack. 
Roy, lantern in hand, goes up the ladder, saying, I'll go up first. I got to get to town and stop Norton from tying up Kramer's property with some legal tricks. He pushes up the trap door, and as his head appears, last picture, Carp Mallory, who is standing behind Roy with a poker, says, You're hard to get rid of, Rogers, but this ought to do it. Oh! Yes, he meant to kill him. Now he's knocked Roy out, and those other two men are down in the basement, and there's no way they can get out. Ooh, it looks like Norton still will win. Now, don't worry too much about that. Maybe there's another trick up Roy's sleeve. We'll find out next week. Now, let's turn over the page and see what's there. All right. Oh, look, Dick's Adventures. And I'm anxious to read that because an unfortunate thing has happened. Yes, in the early days of America, Dick has been with the American Marines, commanded by Stephen Decatur. The pirates had captured one of the American ships, and they were going to use it against the Americans. And last week, Dick and Stephen Decatur were going to slip through the darkness and destroy the American ship so the pirates couldn't use it against them, when all of a sudden, a big storm blew their ship right out to sea, and they were in terrible danger from the storm. Well, let's read right now and find out what happens next. Here we go with Dick's adventures. Say the magic words with me. riggedy pack a zack a zick Let's have music for adventurous Dick. The excitement of his dream has awakened Dick. He sits up in bed and says to himself, Gee whiz, I was, I was dreaming I was back in the old days. A Marine on Stephen Decatur's ship. We were heading into Tripoli to scuttle one of our men of war captured by the Barbary pirates when a howling gale blew us out into the middle of the Mediterranean. And he loves his dream so much he lays back on the pillow and in a second is sound asleep. In his dream, he finds himself on board the ship again. The storm is over. Everybody aboard ship is working furiously to repair all the damage the storm has done. First picture, second row, Decatur says to Dick, We're returning to Tripoli. Pitch in, Dick. A few days later, in the dark of night, the ship in tip-top shape glides back into the harbor of Tripoli. Last picture, second row, it moves toward the Philadelphia, now captured and manned by the pirates. As they slip up beside the Philadelphia, Dick, who acts as the watch, calls to the pirate watch, saying, We're traitors from Malta. We lost our anchors. Can we make fast to you till morning? A second later, that little ship is next to the Philadelphia. And... Too late, the Barbary crewmen realize they've invited a deadly swarm of enemies aboard. First picture bottom row, there's a terrific battle. is over, the pirates are captured, taken off the ship, and the Philadelphia set afire. As it blazes up, the eerie flames light up the harbor, and on shore, the pirate chieftain curses as he sees how the Americans have out-tricked him. My last picture. On the Yankee ship sailing away from the burning Philadelphia, Decatur looks back and says, I'm sorry we had to scuttle one of our own ships, Dick. I'm sorry there are such things as war. Our country, may she always be right. But our country, right or wrong. Oh, it was too bad about burning the ship, wasn't it? It was such a beautiful ship. Yes, it was. But it would have been worse if the pirates had used that ship against the Americans and had killed Americans or won the war by using it. Yes, it would have been. And I wonder what will happen with Dick next. Well, there's only one way you can find out. (laughs) All right, I'll be here next week. Well, good. Now look, right underneath Dick's adventures, there's Rusty Riley. Oh, yes. And you remember last week, Rusty and his friends and Mr. Miles and the detectives, they captured a lot of crooks and they proved that Mr. Kendall was an innocent man. And all because Rusty was curious about following a little girl in her coaster wagon. Yes. Well, let's see what happens next. Here we go with Rusty Riley. Gallop and run till the road is dusty. Give us music for his horse and Rusty. at the Miles farm out by the barn. Tex is saying to Mr. Miles, Hey, boss, you ought to feel real good. You sure made Kendall and his wife and Queenie happy. I just came from the other farm, and it'd do your heart good to see him." Mr. Miles replies, Well, they have you and Rusty to thank more than me. Besides, Kendall's a good man with trotters and pacers. I'm glad to have him. 
But, uh, Tex, I, I want to see you about another matter. A few minutes later, Tex and Mr. Miles are sitting in Mr. Miles' office. Third picture, top row, Mr. Miles hands Tex a letter. Uh, Tex, here's a letter from my old partner, Bruce Peters. Uh, you read it, will you? Tex scans the letter quickly and then reads aloud, last picture, top row. And since I moved to Chicago, my health has been steadily growing worse. Now my doctor tells me there's a surgeon in Vienna who can help me. Since this is an emergency, I'll be on my way when this letter reaches you. I had no time to wait for an answer from you. So, uh, on the strength of our old friendship, I'm sending my adopted child, Vivian, to stay with you while I'm away. I know this is presumptuous, but uh, I also know what a true friend you are. Good luck and thanks, as ever, Bruce. First picture, bottom row, Tex looks up and says, Hey, I recollect Longhorn Peters when you and him was in the cattle business in the border. So he's sending us as his adopted daughter, Vivian, huh? Well, boss, that ain't so bad. Well, no, I uh, guess not. He uh, doesn't mention her age. I'm hoping she'll be company for Patty. <laughs> Meanwhile, on the state road, next picture, a car goes whizzing down the highway. A motorcycle cop who is off on a side road exclaims, Holy smoke, look at that hot rod go. Must be hitting around 90. And after the speeder, he goes. After a hot chase, the motorcycle cop flags down the speeding car. As they stop, third picture on the row, the trooper says, We don't give tickets to drivers like you. Our magistrate just loves to meet them in person. So just follow me. A half hour later, the phone rings in Mr. Miles' office. He answers it. Hello? Yes, this is Quentin Miles. Well, Mr. Miles, this is the police. We're holding a youngster here for speeding and reckless driving. The party gives your address. And, uh, oh, yes, the name is Vivian. Oh, oh, you mean that young person in the car that was speeding was that daughter, Vivian? Oh, what an awful girl. Yes, 90 miles an hour. Why, that's three times as fast as a girl should go, even when somebody else is driving. Yeah. Uh-oh, it looks like there's going to be more trouble. Well, we'll find out more about that next week. Now, let's go over the page and see... Oh, look, here's Alice in Wonderland. Oh, yes, Alice in Wonderland. You remember last week she left the Mad Hatter's place and she began to follow the little white rabbit, and he just came scampering by. And the rabbit led her into Tulgy Wood, where Alice couldn't find her way. I wonder what she'll find in Tulgy Wood. Well, let's read right now and find out. Here we go with Alice in Wonderland. Say the magic words with me. And, and now, now for, for a story that gets, gets curiouser and, and curiouser. Alice, Alice in Wonderland. Wonderland. So, so music, music, sir. Music, sir. Lost in Wonderland, Alice wanders through the eerie depths of Tolji Wood. First, she sees a pair of spectacles with legs up and staring at her. And a funny bird with a face like a mirror. And she exclaims, Oh, no, please. No more nonsense. She walks a little further. And she stumbles on a large automobile horn, which runs off, followed by a lot of baby automobile horns. And Alice exclaims, Oh, oh, excuse me. And she continues along. More weird creatures appear from the shadows of Tolji Wood, third picture. And all of them look half animal and half something crazy. She sees strange-looking frogs. And then, a bird with a long neck like an accordion. And she exclaims, Goodness, when I get home, I shall write a book about this place. Last picture, top row, she continues on her way. Then a strange creature with a bird's head and a body like a bird's cage dashes by. And then Alice sees a sign which reads, Don't step on the mom rats. Alice exclaims, 
and she looks around her feet and sees a lot of funny-looking little flower-like things. And as Alice watches, the moon rats form themselves into a sort of arrow, first picture bottom row. And then the arrow points toward a path. And Alice exclaims, Oh, a path? They're showing me the way out of here. So Alice hurries along. And all of a sudden, she meets an odd brush dog. <laughs> An animal with the body of a dog and a head in the shape of a brush. Alice says, Oh, dear, he's brushing the path away. And as the dog goes by her brushing the path away, third picture, bottom row, Alice, standing on one last bit of path, exclaims, Oh, now I shall never get out of this place. And she sits down, last picture, as the mom rats and all the other weird creatures surround her. And Alice cries, Oh, now, no one will ever find me here. Poor Alice sinks down wearily. And suddenly, a strangely familiar form begins to take shape above her. It's the Cheshire Cat. He looks down at Alice and says, Hello. with a lot of little baby automobile horns. <laughs> Isn't that funny? <laughs> yes, and imagine spectacles running around with legs on them. Yes, it certainly is weird. I wonder if she'll ever get out of there. Well, maybe the Cheshire Cat will help her. That's right. He did help her once before. Well, we'll find that out next week. Now, that's all the time I have. But before I go, here's that nice fellow with some more interesting information. <laughs> Well, honey, and all you boys and girls, I've got to go now. All right, Mr. Connie Weekly Man, but I'll be waiting for you next week. Okay, that's a date, and a date with all you boys and girls. Be sure to meet me with our little friend, Miss Honey, next week when I read Puck the Comic Weekly. For I'm the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man. I'll be back to read the funnies to you happy boys and honeys. Don't forget, boys and girls, see you all next week. Your friend, the Comic Weekly Man... The Jolly Comic Weekly Man. <laughs>